Tim Reese, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. I'm glad you could be here. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you again. So we just got back from the Portrait Society of America where we, uh, I mean, got to talk a little bit there. Actually even saw each other on the way home on the, on, uh, in the plane or in the <laughs> yeah. airport line. That was fun. Yeah. Um, but, um, but it was good to see you there, but it's good to catch up too and just uh, to learn a little bit more about you. Obviously, we've known each other for a while, but there's probably a lot of things that I don't know about you, and I'm anxious to uh, to find out what those things are. So this this should be fun. So first of yeah. all, I want to find out about the space that you're sitting in. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, so it's a building in downtown Makokoda. When we moved here uh, almost two years ago, I bought a small building here. And then in last October, another building came up for sale that used to be a photography studio. And uh, so I snatched that up. So it has um, pretty tall ceilings, which, you know, there's a drop ceiling in here right now. Um, I'm going to take that up. There's the original tin ceiling above that. <clears throat> so I'll be taking that out and then I can work on some larger paintings. It'll give me an extra two feet of uh, space. Oh, wow. There. So this is an old building the, then. Yeah, late 1800. There's actually a bowling alley. <laughs> upstairs in the upstairs? building upstairs really yeah uh so i own i own obviously the whole building um and the upstairs was the original bowling alley that they used in the like 30s 40s moving forward <laughs> um so it's it's a little uh rough shape right now it hasn't been used in decades really but, uh it's four lanes in it yeah are you gonna gut yeah. that and turn it into something else or leave it I was originally going to turn it into more studio space and just punch some skylights up there. <clears throat> um, now I'm I'm not sure. Actually, it, it turns out there's I probably have enough space down here. It's uh, about 2,500 square feet per level, <clears throat> and so if I feel like I have enough space down here, I might just slowly kind of restore the upstairs and just have it as a hangout. So what state is this in, for those who don't know that town? Yeah, this is in Iowa. Uh, we're on the very eastern tip in the nose of Iowa, about three hours, a little under three hours from Chicago. Okay. So yeah. tell us, so I know you're not originally from Iowa, um, but tell us a little bit about your, how you grew up, how you ended up becoming an artist, and, and what that path looked like. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's, um, I didn't know I was going to be an artist growing up. Um, I did do drawing, but I also wrote a lot. And I was really into baseball and just uh, scholastics, taking um, advanced classes in school. And uh, we bounced around a lot as a kid. I was in California and then up to Montana and then back down to California, up to Montana again. And eventually we ended up in Arizona. Uh, for my uh, middle school years and high school. And I took art classes in high school, but the teachers always said that you couldn't have a career in art, that if uh, you wanted to be an artist, you had to be an art teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I never really considered that. Um, I kind of briefly considered maybe, uh, maybe doing comic book art. So I was kind of doing that for a little bit. And then... Uh, uh, wasn't really enchanted with any art school that I saw. I was act I was actually accepted into a few different art schools uh, through the high school portfolio review program. Um, I had a full ride scholarship to any state university just because of the ranking that I finished high school. Um, but I didn't like the art departments of anything in Arizona. So I kind of just did general education classes to try and figure out what I wanted to do. Um, then I heard about an animation school uh, called Collins College, and the teachers there worked on like Land Before Time and Anastasia and Titan AE, uh, like you know old Don Bluth films and um, Fox Animation Studio. And so I actually attended there for a year and learned to do cell animation. So I you know, do all the drawings, <laughs> and then we switched to computers. And I absolutely hated sitting in front of a computer all day, so I dropped out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, I was working at a hospital in the emergency room and doing some registration stuff, um, learning how I got my um, emergency medical technician certification um, and decided I wanted to go down the medical path. So I started taking classes for that. 
Um, and then it was in 2000, end of 2008, beginning of 2009, I picked up a magazine in a Barnes and Noble that had paintings by Daniel Graves and Jeremy Lipking and Richard Schmid and, and some other artists. And when I looked at it, I realized that you could be an artist today and make paintings and have a living being an artist um, and actually a decent living being an artist. And the skills that all of my teachers growing up told me died with the old masters, you could actually acquire those skills today and learn how to paint. And so uh, I decided to become a painter after that. That was the last uh, last biology classes and everything that I took. I, I actually did sign up for art class the following uh, semester at the college. Um, and at the same time, I registered for a three-day workshop with Jeremy Lipking in Scottsdale. And I did the art classes for like three weeks. And then I took the workshop. And after the workshop, I told my art teacher I was never coming back to art class again. <laughs> and I quit school and, and just started painting. Really? And, and that so was, uh, how that was, old were you at this point? Uh, I was 24. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So how did you go about getting your education at this point? Uh, I well, mean, you said I you that... just started painting. What does that mean exactly? You must not have just started selling paintings right out of one workshop from Jeremy Lipking. Or did you? like a month. Yeah. What? What's that? Yeah, like a month afterwards, after the workshop I did. Yeah, no I started kidding. Selling paintings. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Um, yeah, I uh, took uh, the first what, five, six paintings that I finished, and I started walking into downtown Phoenix during an art walk, and I went to the different galleries. I found uh, one or two galleries that showed representational work, mm -hmm. and so I showed the paintings that I had and asked if they'd be interested in showing them. And those galleries were only open twice a month. It was the sec first and third Friday. And uh, there was a gal there who liked the work and said she was willing to put it up for sale. And um, so she started selling them here and there. And uh, yeah, that's how I kind of got gotta started. You got to be kidding me. One that's month. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. unbelievable. That's unbelievable. So tell me. Yeah, I've done like other stuff, mostly abstract stuff before. Um, and, you know, I drew a lot before. Um, but I'd never oil painted before. So these were just kind of my first first ones. So what do you attribute your success to? You said such quick success. Is it is was it your drawing skills or Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. So because I drew a lot and actually at the hospital in my downtime I would get bored and I would just use the regular ballpoint pens that we had and I would look up paintings or drawings that I liked or pictures of animals and and I would use a ballpoint pen to carefully draw those things uh, and learn how to draw without making a mistake um, to think and to be careful and if I did make a mistake learn how to fold it into the drawing so it would not be um, obvious at all and um, so my drawing skills were decent enough and my color skills were pretty awful but I mean if you can draw decently in a painting and understand you know, values and shapes and edges, um, then that's pretty much the majority of what you need for it to come across as realistic. Um, and I was always conservative with color, especially in the beginning, um, as opposed to going over the top garish. So I kind of sort of snuck up on realism that way. Uh, but yeah, it was totally the drawing skills for sure. So what um, gave you the confidence? I mean, there's a lot of people that might watch this that would just be mind blown that you would have the confidence after one workshop to walk into a gallery with paintings under your arm like that. What do you attribute that to? Um, well, a couple things. First, I'm of the mentality that if I've seen somebody do something, I assume it can be done by just about anyone. I mean, it's sort of the, the logic of my, the underpinning logic of my whole personality is, oh, that person was able to do that? Well, that means I should be able to do that because I'm a person also, and I'll figure out what they did first, and then I'll replicate that, and I should be able to do that. I mean, that's sort of a simple equation for me. So that's kind of the 
I guess, blind confidence. Also, at that time, I didn't know how much work actually goes into painting and how hard it should be because I never knew anybody who did it, really. So I didn't know you're supposed to, like, study for years and struggle <laughs> and claw your way into a gallery. I didn't know. I thought you just did paintings and you walked into a gallery and brought them there. So there's a little bit of that naive kind of thing there um, and just an assumption that I could do it. Um, and I think that's kind of... And then also, I, I feel like I had a fairly decent gauge of quality at, at that point, even. Uh, I was able to discern paintings that I did not like and didn't think were good versus what I did like and I did think were good. And when I looked at my paintings, I thought they were good enough to be in the particular gallery uh, settings that I was taking them to. Um, I mean, I wasn't taking them to Scottsdale right out, out of the bat after my first month of painting. I was taking them to Phoenix, which is a little more urban. Um, you know, it doesn't have like the the price tags associated with it or the reputation associated with it that, that some of the other gallery scenes might have. Um, so I feel like I targeted an appropriate spot. Um, my work was at an appropriate level. I found gallery that would work to showcase my paintings that would fit with their paintings and attract the right clientele. So, I mean, there's a lot of those subtle things that went with it, as well as the fact that I thought the paintings were good enough. Um, I, you know, I would want to hang those paintings on my wall, so I figured somebody else might want to as well. Wow. Um, okay, so that's interesting. I have a lot, I have lots of questions based on that because it's so unusual. <laughs> One month from a single workshop, um, but it sounds to me like even though you had some art classes, most of your drawing training was just you sort of figuring things out by looking at other artists. Is that correct? Yeah, nobody showed me how to draw. Um, I just replicated what I saw a lot. Uh, you know, just copied pictures, copied comic books when I was younger. Um, mostly out of boredom, really. Uh, not because I was trying to learn or anything. It's, so the learning and the, the skill happened through osmosis of trying to depict things because I had nothing else to do. Um, you know, when I was working at the, I, so I was working the overnight shift at the hospital. Um, and in the summer when nobody's in Arizona, the night shift at the hospital is completely dead. We see, you know, a couple dozen patients a night. So there's a lot of downtime. And so I would just be drawing and copying. And um, I didn't think of it as training. You know, I, I've, I've had a lot of students who sort of struggle and push against the drawing thing because they want to paint and they feel like drawing is the work that you have to do and, and that it's an active learning thing that they have to push through to get to painting. You know, I never had that viewpoint. Drawing for me was just something I was doing because I was bored and interested and I was just interested in making it better. And so those skills came a little more naturally for me. Yeah. Um, so that, okay, so I want to ask you about something you said earlier. You said that you are of the mindset that any, if one person can do it, any other human being can do it. But you and I have been teaching a long time, both of us have. Um, I've been teaching mm -hmm. for, gosh, 20, 20 years now, I think, privately out of my studio. Yeah. And um, that may be true. We, uh, this isn't the place to talk about that. <laughs> What's that? And <laughs> now that I'm now that I've had experience, I don't know that that's true. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Well, because I was going to say. Funniest kind of mindset of how the world should work. Okay. Well, yeah. What I was going to say is I've, after teaching 20 years, it doesn't come naturally to some people. It's very difficult for them to be able to draw. For you, it seems like it was, you you clearly have an aptitude for it. Um, otherwise, there's no, there's, there's no way you could have done that without the aptitude, without instruction. Um, so the question I have is as a teacher, and I think you've kind of already answered this, but maybe you could expound on your teaching philosophy a little bit, but, and that is that as a teacher, do you have that attitude toward your students? Like, Hey, any student can do what I do because I can do it or any student can uh, do what any artist can do. I wouldn't say what any artist can do. Um, but the type of stuff that I would, uh, teach in the atelier, as far as, classical training through a series of exercises that build upon one another. Um, I, f I do believe that anybody can follow that instruction along that path and follow the steps and have successful and satisfactory results. Um, it yields a, a very particular type of um, work, 
but it's sort of it's more craftsmanship oriented versus maybe some of the artistry element that they may desire. So, for example, I have a ton of students who have wanted to paint like Richard Schmidt. And that's great, but he's probably one of the harder painters to emulate because everything he does requires so much skill and focus and knowledge packed into every stroke that's done. And it's it's not built off of a process of one step following another step following another step following another step until you've refined a product at the end. It's based off of the philosophy that you're going to handle all the balls in the air and think about everything simultaneously, think about the end, think about the beginning, think about everything that goes in between, and then hit each stroke with that knowledge all in mind and never losing sight of that. And that is very difficult to do. And I think a very small percentage of artists, even not just people, but artists have the capacity, a mental capacity and engagement and interest and focus to be able to do something like that. Um, however, the stuff that I taught in the atelier was fully with the belief, and I still believe that given the proper training and following the right steps and taking the time, anyone can come to a satisfactory conclusion. So, so yes, I believe anybody can draw and paint, but there are certain ways that are more appropriate for people depending on their personality. And I think that ends up being a big uh, um, wall that people hit is what they're interested in doing, um, doesn't always match their sort of m what their mental alignment would be for that sort of work. And, mm -hmm. and you really do have to find the, find the balance of what you want to do and what is mentally comfortable for you to do um, and what you're willing to put the time into also. I mean, the step-by-step -step process is great because it can yield a, a result, but then you're looking at a painting that's 100, 200 plus hours. You know, people like the idea of all la prima, you're done in three hours and finished, but that's not always, in most cases, that, that's not feasible for people to be able to do, but they just don't want to spend the time for the other route. So, I mean, it's it's a tricky balance, um, but I do believe anybody can be taught to draw right. paint. I've, I've taught an eight-year-old who's never drawn before how to draw the Mona Lisa before, and it came out pretty darn well after you know a class or two. Um, so I believe everybody has that capacity. Um, I was naive enough to believe that I could do anything that any artist has done before. Um, and that, that was my approach, which I- Well, that might be true. <laughs> well, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, there's not enough time to find out. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Okay, so talk a little bit more about how you do train then at your atelier, this this step-by-step -step process that you're talking about? So it started with um, the Scasso Art School coming to me, asking me to create a kind of part-time training program that would be an ongoing thing. They wanted a year of drawing and a year of painting. And so I had to look back at uh, books from the past and then also what other ateliers were doing and create a curriculum and classes designed off of the premise that I would get students for three 10-week blocks to teach them how to draw, and then three 10-week blocks to teach them how to paint. And so I sort of distilled and focused the assignments into uh, what I felt were the sort of bare bones that people would need to learn to be able to be successful and go on and, and have a, a career in painting. Um, and I feel like we did a pretty good job. And it's it's based primarily, it starts with the sort of French academic process, you know, copying bark plates, then copying casts, and then uh, doing master copies, you know, just this sort of standard atelier stuff. It's, it was just very organized. You know, I'm a very, uh, I like to everything to be well thought out and organized. Um, and so that program sort of reflects this. It, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't what my later atelier was, which was sort of a more open apprenticeship sort of thing where I went from student to student and they went at their own pace. I had to design a program in which I could bring everybody up together 10 weeks at a time and get everybody to a working capacity and understanding and skill set to be able to go on to the next level, even if they hadn't even finished an actual drawing. They may have only like finished one drawing in that 10 weeks, but they still had to go on to the next step. So there were a series of assignments that would build all that knowledge in there. 
Right. Um, and I, I do feel it was pretty successful. We had really good results with it. So are you still doing that now in your new studio? <clears throat> well, here in Makokota, um, nobody has that much of an interest in learning how to draw or paint. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm not teaching at all out here. And that's kind of one of the reasons we moved out here. I wanted to, to paint for myself more. I was, I was just doing too much teaching. You know, I'd, I'd go into the studio at 4 a.m. and I'd leave at, you know, 5, 6 p.m. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, I, my kids were being born and I didn't want to miss that. And, you know, I wanted to see them grow up. So we, we came out here. So um, <clears throat> now what we did do, uh, we had so much interest in people coming to the Scasso Artist School about this program we were doing um, that we decided to have it all filmed for people. I, I was filming demonstrations already for people who would miss a class. So I'd have something available for them to watch if they missed, because, you know, everything was very condensed 10 weeks at a time. So you miss one day, you miss a lot. And so I was filming everything so that people could watch whatever they missed. And people would visit the school and then they would see that I was doing all this filming and they would be interested in the program. And they would say, oh, well, I'm from, you know, some remote state here and I don't have access to an atelier and I would love to be able to do something like this, but I just can't go there or just can't afford it. And so we... Uh, <clears throat> We decided to go back and refilm a lot of the footage, um, and I also wrote associated textbooks with it. So now the teaching that we have is basically that program that we did um, now in a video and textbook bundle. So it's like 100 hours of drawing instructional video with a textbook, and then 100 hours of painting instruction videos with a textbook, and then people can work through that at their own pace and you know there's a schedule in there if they want to follow the original schedule or they can go at their own pace so that they can finish each assignment in detail we kind of leave that up to the the student and then um you know people who have purchased the bundle that we send out to them if they finish one of the assignments they can shoot it over to me in my dropbox and i can give them a critique of it and so they kind of get the remote learning experience that way and you're doing um, that currently yeah. Yeah. We've been selling the, the bundles now for, gosh, probably four years, okay. three, four years now. Um, and we've shipped them all over the world and it's great. We haven't, I haven't had the time to be able to offer the critiques and feedback before. Um, but now I kind of miss teaching and haven't done it in a while. And now I have a little bit more time. Um, so I'm opening it up. So people who have already bought it before will buy it in the future. They can do the assignments and send it in. Oh, that's, that's a really cool opportunity. So, you know, you were kind enough to give me a few of your textbooks. I don't know if you had them all finished at that point, but I was, yeah, I might, so, you haven't, or did you at I, the time? I, I might not have had the painting one done. Oh, no, I don't no. think you did. No, you only gave me drawing ones, but I was, I was really impressed with how prolific you are as a writer to be able to write those textbooks as well as a painter. I mean, that's kind of unbelievable. That you got that much content. These are thick books that that yeah. you gave me. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely are uh, sort of textbooks. But I I do enjoy writing a lot, um, and uh, I've taken kind of a now more of a cue from some of the science authors that I like, and that you should try to condense things to be as understandable and clean and concise as possible. Uh, and it's it's funny that you mentioned me being prolific as a writer because. My wife and I were going back looking at the drawing textbook the uh, the other week because we're deconstructing it, um, and uh, she just kept ragging on me because I'd have such uh, kind of archaic, poetic sounding sentences in there that looked like they were from an 1800s book, and it was because I wrote that right after I had read a dozen books from the 1800s on how to draw in the atelier format. Uh -huh. So writing there is a little kind of over the top and like. Uh, there a little extra added in there that really needed to be chopped down. So we've been trying to kind of refine that and, and okay. bring it back to normal, digestible level. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Some people probably really like that. That might be a, an appeal to a certain audience. So, um, so tell me um, a little bit about your day to day now. Are you still getting up at four a.m. and going home at six p.m.? No. Okay. No. <laughs> what is uh, it? What's a day like in your studio now? Or not even in your studio. Well, What's a day like in your life? So that's actually changed recently. Uh, for the first year and a half we were here, or a little over a year, it was, um, I would be 
our, our daughter was born, our third daughter was born here right after we moved here, you know, like a month after we moved here. And so I had to help out with the kids quite a bit more. So I was going into the studio at 3 a.m. Oh. And then I would come home at 7 a.m. And then I would help feed and dress the kids and get the bigger kids off to school. And then when the younger kids went down for a nap in the afternoon at about one, I'd go back to the studio and paint from one to four and then then come back home and pick up the older kid from school and and then spend time with the family. And so I would just be painting while everybody's asleep. And then I would go to bed at like 730 or eight o'clock at night because I was so tired. Um, so then I wanted to have a little bit more of a life and a normal schedule. And so we got our daughter, our middle daughter into preschool now. <clears throat> and now I paint from like 8.30 to 4.30. Okay. Like, so now I, I get up and I get the kids off to school, paint from 8.30 to 4.30. We're able to finally get the kids to sleep without us falling asleep in bed with them. They're, they're finally like sleep independent now. And so we can get them to bed at 8.30 or so. And then my wife and I for the first time in seven years have had some adult time after the kids go to bed. Um, so that's, that's, I feel like a grown up now. <laughs> well, my twins are 18. They just graduated from high school or they will be this week. So it goes fast. Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. So, and life changes a lot. My time is really starting to free up, but yeah, it's a crazy right. time that you're in right now with little kids. I remember that very well. I just don't want to miss anything, you know? So oh yeah. Don't. Yeah. Don't. You're doing the right thing. On a lot of stuff. I'm painting way less than I should be painting. <laughs> yeah. I think most artists with families, that's their experience. That's that at least the ones I've spoken to. So yeah, I get that. Um, so you, your family's clearly important to you. I think this actually is a good time. I want to pull up your website here. Okay. Cause you, mm -hmm. You really have uh, now four muses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because you paint your family and your wife. You've always painted your wife so much. And maybe you can tell us in a minute a little bit about how you were actually introduced to your wife and how that came about. But because I yeah. find that a really interesting story. Um, but then now yeah. you kids are so predominant in your work. And I'm just going to pull up a few pieces um, to show those people who watch this on YouTube um, just how much you paint your family. So this is your wife and one of your daughters. Mm, um, yeah. It's called Calming Embrace. And I'll actually, I'll have you, why don't you tell me a couple paintings that are meaningful, obviously that are all going to be meaningful to you. It's all your family, but a couple that are particularly meaningful to you that I could pull up. <clears throat> well, uh, probably the... <laughs> One of the most meaningful, I guess, and probably one of the most well-known is uh, The Bribe, where my son's eating the cupcake. Right here. It's, this uh, one was in the Portrait Society of America contest. Yeah. So this was, you know, because my wife would be overwhelmed from, you know, being pregnant and exhausted and taking care of our son. And I'd come home and the house would be kind of destroyed. And it was just kind of, you know, a day in the life sort of a thing. And so this scene is actually staged. We actually did it in my studio. Um and uh added all these elements to it to kind of help to to the narrative so this this is one of the few pieces that i've done which is actually has a little more narrative and interesting things built into it like the the titles of the art books on the bottom are the artists who influence the style uh, and techniques that are in the painting um there are some books on the top uh like children's books and books on parenting and stuff that kind of just add a humor to the painting um and then there's things like, you know, the painting that's hanging on the wall behind my wife is a painting my son actually did um, months and months before and um, and uh, just random stuff like that. And so uh, um, it had a lot more built into it. And then this, this one here was the follow-up painting I did a year later, um, which is sort of a reversal of roles. Like now my wife is finally content because she's had the baby and my son is just bored because he's sitting around waiting for her to finish all the time. Um, so those were, uh, those are sort of meaningful paintings to the, to me. And, um, because of, 
the stories associated with them. Yeah. And then there's another one um, of my wife holding our son in Barcelona. Okay. Um, it's the, one of the first big ones. Let me go that back to that one uh, sec here. Ah, uh, this one the, here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is gorgeous. The kiss. So this is one of the first uh, large paintings I did with um, of my family, um, <clears throat> and it was from a trip in Barcelona. And I didn't even have my phone. I, I did a bunch or my camera. I did a bunch of uh, plain air sketches of the landscape. And then I just took some pictures with my phone at the time. This is back in, I think, 2017 or so. And um, and then I did a large painting from that. <clears throat> and this was sort of a, a more remarkable piece for me for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because I kind of developed a new technique of painting where I finally figured out how I wanted to paint. Um, and this was sort of the first one to represent that. Um, where I had to work from a, a really poor photograph that had no information on it. And then I had to do a lot of anatomy studies and then build that anatomy into the paint application to create more depth. Um, really? So it was, a, it, it ended up combining all of the techniques that I was teaching in my atelier into sort of one painting and then getting them to marriage to a relatively impressionistic background, which was kind of a challenge also. Um, so I vividly remember doing this painting and it being kind of a landmark piece for me. Um, and it was also a notable because it was uh, one of the first ones I sold through Arcadia, um, which ultimately led to me being represented by them, which was always the dream of mine ever since I started painting, actually. Hmm. Yeah, that's a gorgeous painting. So the figure in this, if it's 45 inches tall, the figure would maybe be 30 high. Yeah, like three feet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that and all that from a cell phone picture in 2017. So yeah. the cameras weren't even it was as good as they are now, uh, right? No, it was it was very very blurry picture. Unbelievable. Um, so yeah, I had to kind that of is gorgeous. Yeah, work around that. Yeah, so these paintings here from the Beauty in Motion series, this uh, was an evolution out of me painting models at the Pal and Chisel in Chicago. Um, I kind of embraced this Richard Schmidt idea. In, in, well, in 2009, I should back up and say, in, in 2009, I started painting with a group of people in Scottsdale. Um, and one of the gals there, her name was Bonnie Anderson, and she told me about the palette and chisel in Chicago. And she said, that's where Richard Schmidt went. And I said, who's Richard Schmidt? And she said, you don't know who that is? And so she showed me his book. <clears throat> and so I, I received his, his book as a gift from um, someone. And, and, uh, learned all about Richard Schmid and the idea that you could just look at a model and paint them and and that can be your painting career if you want and you just look at something and paint it and make it beautiful and there's nothing wrong with that because I always felt terribly uncreative I still feel like I'm not a very creative person and so I like this idea that I could just look at something and paint it and so I moved to Chicago uh the fall of 2009 and just painted models and and uh a lot of these paintings, especially these ones here, these are from those early days in Chicago, painting models in my studio and at the palette and chisel. Um, and then eventually they became more elaborate and more colorful. When I moved to Arizona and I had more light and cleaner light, I started to use brighter colors and, and Brittany, my wife, would start designing dresses. Um, and so we'd drape the models and do these, you know, sort of big splashy paintings. Um, <clears throat> from from those and then then eventually uh you know i kind of got bored with that approach and wanted to enter something a little more contemporary and so i started doing this series here this idea of combining um more rendered realism with sort of a graphic quality and focusing on the design element of it yeah um so sort of taking what would be a regular pose that might not even be that interesting and then using paint application and color um, and a variety of edges to really design something that's interesting to look at just because. Um, and this painting, actually, this one here, I did this in Qatar. I was invited over to the Middle East um, from the Qatar Fine Art Association, uh, which I was very skeptical when they reached out to me on social media. Um, it sounded too good to be true. They offered me uh, a ticket to Qatar and a stay at the five-star hotel there and all my meals paid for, and I'd get a personal driver 
and they would provide art supplies. And all I had to do was give them a painting at the end of 10 days. Wow. And, what uh, an opportunity. Yeah. It, it certainly didn't sound real, but I said, sure, why not? I'll try it. And it was real and it was totally amazing. And I loved it. And uh, this is the painting I ended up doing and giving to the, uh, the association there. Wow. And this is your wife as well. It, yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So tell us a little bit about that because she's clearly well, probably your primary muse. And tell us a little bit about how you met your wife and how that came about. So I was living in Chicago. Um, I was actually engaged at the time. Um, and my friends were opening up a, a studio school in in Arizona, in South Scottsdale or North Tempe, right around that area. And they invited me out for the opening to help them finish up and promote it and to paint at the um, their opening day from the model. And so I went out there. Um, and while I was out there, my fiance kind of, and I kind of broke up. She kind of went off with someone else. Um, and uh, Brittany happened to be a model there uh, while I was painting. And eventually my painting became good enough of her that she walked over and started talking to me. <laughs> and we had a nice conversation. And then she came back later that day for the official grand opening. And we had a good conversation then. And then we went out to dinner. And then we met up again the next night for dinner. and. Uh, then I flew back to Chicago and I was getting ready for a show at the Palette and Chisel. And so I invited her to come out to Chicago. I told her I'd buy her a round trip ticket to Chicago and and uh, she could come out for two weeks and I would paint her and then she could fly back. And so she came out to Chicago and uh, she just never went home. And we were together ever since. Wow, that's and, a really cool story. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. And so in, I'm just going to flip through a couple of these too, because yeah, just to show how much you paint your wife. I mean, she's in a huge number of paintings, which I think is a really cool and beautiful thing. How does your wife respond yeah. to being painted so much? Um, I don't think she really cares. Um, it's just kind of whatever to her. She went to art school, actually. She actually has a degree in art. Um, which is probably one reason she's such a good model. But um, she actually doesn't think she's particularly pretty, which I highly disagree. Yeah, so do I. I think she's classical beauty. Um, and so I enjoy painting her whenever I can, although I do try to vary it quite a bit. I um, actually have a mannequin in the studio here that I work off of, sort of a generic-looking mannequin. And so... Nowadays, when I'm doing paintings that are not supposed to be specifically her, I'll actually use the mannequin to um, see how to change the bone structure a little bit and alter mm. things and make it not quite her. So so it becomes one of those, like, it could be her, it might not be her, you, you don't really know. Right. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll do that whenever I'm, whenever the portrait is not as important in the painting. Yeah, this one here. Um, can you pronounce that one for me? Oh, Mina Parstek. Yeah, what That's is her, that referring to? So her family's original uh, originally came from Poland, and their last name was Naparstek, ah. and uh, shortened it to Nopar. And her her last name now is Nopar. Okay. Okay. And it act, um, it's Polish, I think, for thimble, or uh, because they were seamstresses back then. Oh no, which kidding. is interesting likes to sew and, and make clothes. So it's kind of fitting. Well, this one I find particularly interesting because it, it really shows off what I think is special about your wife. And I mean, I, from a physical standpoint, referring to her physical beauty is that she's timeless. And this one looks like it could have been painted hundreds of years ago or yesterday. Um, I particularly oh, love this necklace. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that was beautiful. sort of the impetus for really um we found that at, at a shop in san diego and bought it and fell in love with it and uh i really wanted to do a painting that was just a more classical polished older sort of resonating painting yeah and uh, we actually did this with the intent to turn it into a video um and it turned out to be something like 70 or 80 hours long <laughs> so, wow so Maybe someday I can cut that down into something reasonable and, and release it as a video, but I still have all that footage just kind of waiting there. Cause I, yeah. I did sort of everything 
yeah, painting, you know, glazes and scraping and build up and all sorts of stuff. So the, the, the one thing that makes this contemporary is that uh, blurry background, that, that <laughs> modern photographic influence where you've got the Boku in the background. Yeah. Well, I don't even know that that makes it modern because, I mean, you see paintings of the past where they're using the camera obscura and achieve that. But I think throwing that metal easel back there is definitely like a... Oh, is that an easel? It looked like a church yeah. window. Oh, okay. I like that. That's yeah, probably better, that's yeah. what I thought that was, yeah. like one of those really thin sliver windows of like a Gothic church or something. Oh, cool. Now well, I that's even yeah. tell people that. Yeah. yeah. Well, now all I can yeah, see is the easel, but <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great. So earlier, um, you mentioned that um, you're not a very creative person. So yeah. I want to talk about that a little bit because I, I beg to differ. So how do you define creativity? Um, I would say ideas coming to one continually, um, yeah. at least painting. Ideas. I, I don't really have a lot of, you know, I know people who have so many cool ideas for paintings that they tell me about. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I want to come up with an idea like that. And I don't really have those ideas. I feel, and, and this became, this was a big thing for me for a while until I read a book called Rockwell on Rockwell, uh, which is, Nor I don't know if you're familiar with the book, Norman mm -hmm. Rockwell's process on how he came up and with and executed his paintings. Um, and he was very prolific, you know, and he had a lot of ideas, a huge range of subject matter. And uh, he says in the book how he's not a creative person. And I, I said, that's really strange. I don't really understand that. And he says he could never come up with an idea. And so what he would do is creativity exercise where he would start with something simple like a lamppost and he would sketch it out in 10 or 15 seconds. And then he would sketch out the next thing that popped into his mind, like a sailor leaning on the lamppost. And then that would remind him of a sailor getting a tattoo. And then that would remind him of this. And that would remind him of this. And it would go through the stream of thought process where uh, he, he began making little narratives that would just pop into his head because of an association from an image he had just drawn. And then that would eventually cultivate more ideas. And he said he would go through two or three hours sometimes and not come up with anything he would like and just trash that. And then he would do the exercise again later on until he would come up with an idea that he thought was really good. And then he would show this little sketch to a neighbor to see if they sort of understood it and got it. And if it passed the mustard, then he would turn it into a painting. And this was a process he went through for a lot of his paintings. And it made me realize that creativity and is not necessarily things popping into your head of like, oh, this would be so cool. I should paint this. Creativity is taking a lot of outside factors and distilling them and sort of mixing it together in a soup and then applying your own voice to it and seeing what comes out the other side sometimes. And so that's, that's what a lot of my paintings are now. Um, and I feel like that's how I'm coming up with things. I, it's a mixture of me looking at old paintings and modern paintings of other painters and my own paintings and then coming up with sort of a vague idea of, you know, like, oh, I like this outfit. I want to take it to the beach. And then, you know, I like this lighting condition here. Let's go do this over here. And and then also working with whoever my model happens to be, if it's my kids or somebody else's kids or, or Brittany or whoever. And then sort of trying to coach them, but then letting them also be natural. And then from that natural element, selecting what coincides with the rough outline I had in my idea so that I'm not trying to make anything that's too forced or stiff. And then from that, distill something that looks natural and new and creative, but also coincides with this vague idea I had from looking at all these other paintings. And then I do color sketches of that and then drawings of that. And then I combine it all together on the canvas and build something that I hope is new and different and interesting to look at. And so it's, I don't feel like I'm creative because these things aren't just popping into my head like, oh, I should paint this, this would be cool, and I do it. it it's this very labored process where I feel like I'm really squeezing everything I can out of it to get the best thing I can get. Yeah, that's interesting because, um, yeah. so, my opinion on creativity, I mean, I think creativity is kind of a broad 
subject, right? I think there's more than one definition, but the reason I say I think you're a creative person is because I think of creativity as coming up with unique solutions to problems. And so yeah. when I look at your paintings, yeah, when I look at your paintings, you might just be looking, as you put it, I, I didn't know I could just look at something and paint it and make art. You had said that earlier. But, mm -hmm. but when I look at the way you look at things, you're not just copying that thing. You're coming up with a unique solution and making creative decisions through, throughout the painting process. And that's why I say that I see you as a creative person. What, what I think, um, the, the way I would define the, the other thing you described is an imaginative person. You know, that's how I yeah. would define it. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's how I would define yeah. it. But you no, know, I think, you ever heard of that test where they, where, where some people give a bunch of people a brick and they come up with all these different creative ways that you can use a brick and they, they use that okay. test to measure if a person is creative or not. And some people say a paperweight, okay. some people say build a house, some people say, you know, various things. And someone might come with a creative solution, like who knows what a doorstop or grind it up and make pigment out of it or. You know, there's, but they use that just a simple brick in order to say, okay, the creative person will come up with something absolutely unique with this, whereas mm. everyone else is going to do what, what bricks use bricks for what bricks are supposed to be used for. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's how I, I see. that's, yeah. So that's why I say, I think you're very, a very creative person because I mean, the solutions to some of your work, I'm just going to pull up the browser again here. Um, the solutions here are just unbelievable um and i realize again that you are painting things but this isn't exactly what you saw the way you handle this this uh, horizon line right here or the edge of the water i'm sorry not the horizon line but the edge of the That's water and then, and then the horizon yeah. line here um it's it and the brush strokes where you leave it heavy and sometimes you're more thin down to canvas um these are to me are all just beautifully spontaneous and creative decisions this is gorgeous thanks and the lighting yeah. you're a master of light as well which i want to pull up a few paintings to kind of show that off there's that one this one which the skin was probably this is uh golden hour and it's of uh your son right yeah it is yeah, yeah. and um he's your oldest correct that's right yeah um, he's a great mom <laughs> yeah, he's a handsome kid, but he, he loses like no other. He, it looks like some of that skin tone is almost cadmium orange. It looks like it's almost straight cadmium orange. Yeah, well, I don't use cadmium orange, but it could be. Yeah, yeah. Or, I don't or, have. It's so just much. so orange. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. But That's it works. Insane. It feels like it feels like sunset. Um, it's just unbelievable. Like your use of color. Talk about that a little bit. You said earlier in your career that you were sort of uh, uncomfortable with color and you, you painted sort of gray and you've sort of evolved into where you are now. Talk about that evolution yeah, sure. a little bit and where you feel like you've landed. So this is about as colorful as I would get in my paintings. Um, and this was when I started to get more colorful. Usually it'd be more muted than this. So this is and Antique would... Rocker, just for those who are listening. Antique Rocker 20 by 16 oil on panel. And my assumption is that you painted this back in the, uh, 2015, 16 or something. Yeah, that would be about right. Probably okay. 2015. Okay. Uh, um, it was right after we had moved from Chicago to, um, Arizona. So it might've been 2014 or so. Um, and I was still not yet comfortable with color and just starting to explore it. But when I started painting, you know, I was attracted primarily to Jeremy's paintings. And at the time, those were very neutral. Jeremy and Joseph uh, Todorovich, um, you know, both they're, they have that similar color palette, which I absolutely loved. And so, uh, you know, I took that workshop with Jeremy and he kind of made just this big puddle of gray on his palette. And then he would just modify that puddle and work it and and create a harmony with it as he painted. Um, and so that's kind of how I worked because I was always uh, very shy about color. I never really liked color. I, I, well, I never really liked painting in general, but I figured I kind of had to do it. Um, and uh, so I was very conservative and everything was sort of that base gray mixture that I would modify. And it wasn't until 
I met two other artists at the Scottsdale Artist School, probably a little after I did this painting, that my whole understanding and knowledge and comfort with color just kind of exploded. And then after that, you see all these like colorful dress paintings that uh, I'm kind of going over the top with a lot of color. Right. Um, so it was a very, very specific part of my career. Can you tell us um, who these artists were that sent you in that other direction and how and why yeah, and how? Yeah, um, it was just watching them through demonstrations, and they kind of said the same thing in slightly different ways. And it was Casey Baugh and and Rose Franson, actually, who oh, right. lives like four doors down from my studio here. Um, <clears throat> and they were doing a demonstration talking about color, and they basically said that um, everything you mix is a little red, a little yellow, and a little blue. And and that's it. And Rose would say that she goes through a series of questions that either needs to be lighter or darker, more red, more yellow, more blue. And Casey would say something to the effect of, well, a printer just uses cyan, magenta, and yellow, and it prints all the colors that you see. So obviously you should be able to mix everything with a red, a yellow, and a blue. And so that kind of like, that was one of those uh, moments of, oh, if somebody else can do it, I can do it too. Because I was thinking, well, if a printer can do it, just with red, yellow, and blue, then I should be able to do it too. And and so I started to become a lot more literal with colors. Instead of trying to develop a harmony in my paintings, I switched over and completely forgot about harmony. I completely threw out the knowledge of uh, color temperature relationships, um, which was sort of the basis for all my paintings before the, oh, it's a cool light situation, so we need warm shadows, or it's a warm light situation, we need cool shadows. I would completely forget about that. Sometimes paint in neutral white light and at that point what's the temperature relationship you don't know you just have to paint what you're observing and so i just became literal with the colors that i would see and i organized my palette in such a way because you know i like to be really organized and think things through so i had a red and yellow and blue at five different values so a light red yellow and blue that was basically off white that i mixed and then values going down until i had basically off black red yellow and blue and then I would do a poster study of every painting where I would use a five value gray poster study to break down all the values of what I was looking at in the model and the scene. And then when I would go to do the big painting, I would say, okay, well, this section of the painting is a value two. So I'm going to my value two, red, yellow, and blue. And I would mix those around until they were the right color and lay it on. And it would work out. And, and it always worked out because it just followed sort of a mathematical precision of observing the correct value and then using the red, yellow, and blue of that value until you arrived at the right color and then laying it down. And then when it was all done, you could soften as needed to uh, bring the values together or, or mix the red, yellow, and blue mixtures of two values to expand it to a 10 value range. Um, so that was the process that I used for then probably three years um, to do all of my paintings. And it, it was a really kind of rigid, um, no flare, mechanical process of getting the right color that I was observing. And again, it, it, then it trained me to observe color more carefully and copy it literally. And if I copied it literally, I didn't have to worry about relationships. I didn't have to worry about color temperatures. It would just look like what it was supposed to look like. Um, and, and it worked. And then after a while, I actually reduced that palette down to fewer colors. And now, um, now for flesh tones, I basically have three colors that I use and then I modify them a little bit as needed to go lighter or darker. But um, the knowledge that was built into me from those years of red, yellow, and blue and, and fine tuning the value, that's, that's with me now. And so when I'm painting, I usually get pretty literal to either my reference or my color sketch or some combination of the two to, to create the colors that I'm observing. And, and nowadays I paint with no toning on my canvas, just a white. I just go right to town laying the color in. And, and uh, people ask me all the time about it because they say, oh, well, don't you need to tone it to get the right relationships? I said, no, I, I don't worry about the relationships anymore. You know, I've done a color sketch. So, so like, for example, I'm, here's a, um, I'm doing this painting, uh, this painting now, um, okay. which is sort of a version of that one you just shown. Um, and, uh, I work out all the relationships and what I want the painting to look like aesthetically and color wise here. And then I make sure my reference matches my color sketch and then I can just paint the reference and then key it to my color sketch as needed. But I can be pretty literal at that point. 
and I don't have to worry about making sure my background's the correct color or I just zero in on the color of the flesh, mix it, paint it, lay it down and move on. So what I'm noticing about you and about this description is, is that you have kind of a very scientific approach in it, mm. not in the way you paint, but also the way you train yourself to paint. Um, yeah. which I think is fascinating because with my students, I've often told them that painting is not an art, it's a science and it's what you do with the painting that makes it an art. Right. Um, yeah. and, uh, and so, and you're, to me, when I was listening to you, you seem to be reinforcing that idea and the way that you train yourself and the way that you paint that you're, that this is not just some creative explosion where you just like, you know, you vomit the painting onto the canvas, you know, <laughs> like you're yeah. really thinking about a practical approach to how to create a beautiful picture and going through mm -hmm. very rigorous scientific steps um, to get there. And I don't think that's unusual. I mean, the way you do it might be unique to you, but I think um, uh, most good realists that I've spoken to have a similar approach. Not all maybe, but many. I think you're right. Uh, and I was actually kind of surprised to find find that out. Um, a lot of artists that I'd met before I started to meet some of the realist painters and you know portrait and figure painters especially, um, I didn't really connect with. Um, and I started to meet people like you and some of my other friends and realized that their minds are kind of tuned this way. And I like talking to people like that because, you know, kind of, you know, share a similar mindset and uh, conversations are always very interesting that way. Yeah, um, I agree. And so I've just connected to, to artists like that quite a bit more sort of found my people, I guess, yeah. which I thought I that's, that's how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. One of my pet peeves has been over the years, this idea of right and left brain. And I, I, I swear to be a great realist. You can't just be, can't be mm. right brained. You have to right. be both. Um, because, yeah. it, because of that analytical scientific approach that re that's required to solve those complex problems in a, in, in painting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit, um, that, that thing that you showed me, the, the studies, the piece of paper you had, uh, I believe it was four or five studies on there were, and, uh, they were all like only an inch apart. It looked like you maybe masked off with some kind of masking tape and painted between. Is that correct? So yeah. did you do that in oil as well or something like gouache or watercolor? Those are in oil. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever tried doing uh, studies in different mediums? Yeah, I've done uh, watercolor for the uh, dress paintings. I usually did them in watercolor, um, and sometimes I'll use acrylic. Um, for some, I was actually painting oil on top of plastic, like a clear plastic, actually, so I could do overlays and figure some concepts out. Um, so different things like that. Yeah, this just happened to be easy and convenient enough. It's, it's for this latest group of paintings that I'm doing, and I designed them all at once and. Uh, we spent two weeks on the beach last year, and I painted, I think, 12 paintings, and I took 10,000, 13,000 reference photos of wow. the family. Um, I had suitcases full of costumes and uh, design ideas in mind, and then every day when the sun was rising, I would haul them out to the beach and dress everybody when it was like 45 degrees and start snapping photos and then move on to doing paintings. And then we do the same thing at sunset. And then we did that for two weeks. And so I, I accumulated uh, out of all of that, I came back and spent a month going through references in my sketches and cropping things down to, to find stuff that matched what I wanted to do. And that was suitable reference to work from. And that took a month. And I distilled these 10 or 13,000 whatever photographs down into 15 paintings. And those 15 paintings, I then did these small color sketches of all at once so that I could see how they all hung together and looked together and make sure they were all kind of keyed and felt appropriate next to each other. And uh, then I just started going through them, painting them. And so I'm on the fourth one now of that group. Yeah, you're really blessed that your wife and kids cooperate or, or don't they? Or are you fighting them constantly? No, I mean, that's why it takes 10,000 photographs to get <laughs> <Okay>. 15. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm, 
coaching and coaxing and bribing and playing the odds and you know it's a shame because i'll have like one idea in mind and like everything will be almost perfect but something will be so drastically wrong that i can't use the references for it and you know we don't live near a beach now so it's not like we can just like pop out and i can go get the right reference again and sometimes i'll try and change it in the studio and it works sometimes it doesn't um but that's always kind of a gamble over references that did turn out well so so my son he he's great because he'll take direction and he's willing and he kind of likes to be the center of attention a little bit um he's like you know he's the seven-year-old who's friends with everybody at school and like everybody came to his birthday party kind of a thing because he he thrives on that whereas my middle daughter um that first painting you showed calming embrace of my wife holding her um like she screamed for 30 minutes during that photo session and that that photo was one of the only references where she was calm. My wife calmed her down and finally got her to snuggle. And I got that reference and then some color sketches. And then that's what we got out of it. You um, took the so time I, to make color sketches? Oh, yeah. I usually bring my, my – I have a smaller plein air paint box that yeah. I take out to the field. And um, usually, it's, usually it's the landscape. Sometimes I'll try and throw – the blobs of the figure colors in there but that's right. usually not as important as capturing the the color quality and also what how i might want to abstract the background um in a little sketch so usually they're 30 minutes to an hour so let me pull up another one of your um paintings again it, it's the same one that i had pulled up last time it's one of my favorites because of the color and you know how you know i love color um yeah. like this one I imagine if I were to try and do this the way you described, I would at least make a few strokes that represent the shadow side and the light side of his skin tone and then do a color study of the landscape. And is that what you did in this situation? Or did you just do the landscape here as well and sort of depend on the reference and memory for the skin? Uh, that one, it was the landscape and then reference and memory for the skin. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's really um, convincing. But yeah, it had to all be kind of adjusted um, because I think in the photograph, there some things were like, you know, like the shadows were just knocked down completely flat and color had to be pumped in. Um, but that's one of the things that I uh, sort of learned to work around when I was experimenting with that Des Artes Graphica series that I did where I was doing the flat, colorful backgrounds, like the flat, single color backgrounds because I was having difficulty integrating the model into the background without it looking cut and pasted. Mm -hmm. So I figured out to splice in surrounding colors and boost the color and chroma of the shadows to integrate the model into that field of color. And so that's something that I'll use now in paintings like this, where the reference photo may have just been a flat or black shadow. Wait a minute, but explain now that again. I'm not sure I understand. So the figure felt cut and pasted because it's so unbelievably warm compared to the violet backdrop. Well, no, we have to step back. Go to go back to the Desartes Graphica series first. Oh, of all. I'll oh show okay, you okay, okay. So in those paintings, yeah, click on. Oh, that's where in. I missed it. I apologize. So, so you're referring to these paintings, not the one of your son. Right. Okay. So in those, for example, when you click on, um, or click on the blue one right next to that one on the top there. Yeah. Okay, and this is so, called The Birth of Venus. Yeah, in, in this painting, there were uh, so the greens and golds that are kind of like in the middle half tones. Um, they did not exist in the actual um, model when I was mm. doing this. And then on the right side of the figure, there's some strokes that are cooler and a little more blue. And kind of under the armpit, they're kind of bluer and cooler. Mm, um, right those here. did not exist in the model because this was taken in front of a, or painted in front of, um, I recall like a, just a white sheet okay um on a couch and so when i painted it and put that blue background on the model looks like it's cut out and pasted um, right and, and not you've got that blue here too yeah you're letting it so bleed. i figured out how much can you take from the background and, or how to manipulate the flesh colors enough so that it feels like that figure belongs in that field of color without going over the top and make, you know, just smearing blue paint on the figure. And the same is true with her hair also, you know, yeah. and uh, this is something, these were experimental paintings that I was doing kind of pushing how far I could go and how far I needed to go to make things look like they belong together. 
And when I felt like I was getting kind of successful with this, I then pulled that concept into my uh, paintings of figures on the beach, um, where especially I'm working from photos that may be poor and the shadows do not really reveal what's going on with the color and light. So I would then know how to maybe boost the chroma or manipulate the color so that it looks like it belongs in, for example, golden hour lighting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, those experimental paintings were kind of instrumental because, again, like you said, I'm not just copying a photo all of the time. I'm kind of problem solving to figure out how to make things look integrated and natural. Yeah. Um, but this must have been taken at golden hour as well because of the low, the oh, low yeah. light source, right? Yeah. Yes. But it was at a different location. So this one is actually in San Diego where the overall atmosphere is a little more uh, kind of hazy and mm. cooler and uh, the other one was taken in Gulfport, Mississippi, which is sort of uh, Caribbean tropical, you know, and, and so everything's a lot more warm and orange and crisp and clear. And you can see for miles and miles. Right. Um, so the fear really comes through in the two different locations. And so I, I like to go back and forth between painting the two different places. Yeah. And this one, by the way, is sunset in the genre category. Okay. Um, and now let's talk about your plain air a little bit. We haven't mentioned those. How often do you do this and, and do you enjoy it? I, I do enjoy plain air painting a lot and I wish I had more time for it. Um, but uh, plain air, I started doing back in Chicago when I moved to the palette and chisel. First of all, because Richard Schmidt's book said that you should paint everything, not just one thing. So I would get out there and, and paint landscape. But also because I wanted to be able to travel. And um, an easy way to travel if you're an artist is to teach workshops in foreign locations. And so I needed to learn how to landscape paint. And so um, that was sort of the impetus for landscape painting and and i ended up really liking it i don't like to do huge paintings um my sort of attention span for being outside is usually like two to three hours and then i want to go back inside um and so the paintings never really get super huge and they typically are more um, loose impressionistic and you know very directly painted and i take a lot of that paint application knowledge with me because I like to paint the backgrounds of my paintings in this way. Mm -hmm. And and then the challenge becomes, how do I marriage this aesthetic, which is a lot more loose, abstract, and suggested with something like the figures that I'm doing, which is are, are typically a lot more polished and refined and have, you know, sort of flesh tones built up and brush strokes that are trying to suggest flesh tones. Um, very kind of different ideas. Um, and so the one of the biggest challenges for me in every painting I do is marriaging these two concepts without it looking forced or out of place. Yeah, that's yeah, these are beautiful. Very beautiful. Okay. Um so we're getting pretty close to 90 minutes here. So um is there anything if you know, I'm hoping that we'll have um viewers that are not only collectors and art enthusiasts, but also people aspiring to be painters. And you've had such a unique path. Mm. That being said, what advice would you give an aspiring painter, um, not in learning to paint, but also in making a career out of it? Uh, well, I think the best advice I kind of had indirectly, which I would probably pass on to anyone else wanting to choose this as a path, is to pay for everything before you start so that you have a really low overhead. So we, when I started, I, I gave up, I, I was living in a really nice apartment in Scottsdale and driving a really nice sports car. And um, I had a lifestyle that was pretty comfortable. And then when I decided to become an artist, I gave all that up, moved to the cheapest apartment I could find in Chicago, got rid of the car, walked, and then just painted all the time. And when we made a little bit of money, we bought our first house, which was $10,000. And it was a very sort of treacherous um, mining shack sort of house. And we lived there for two or three years. 
with no bills and I just painted. And without the pressure of having to produce or work at another job, I was allowed to explore all of my curiosities about painting and learn to be the best painter that I could be instead of focusing on how I was going to make money or um, painting something that I didn't want to paint. Uh, I could really just focus on being an artist. And and I had heard that in a podcast from a few other artists when I first started. And so that kind of became my, my primary goal. And I, I feel like it was pretty successful. Um, I mean, if I could go back in time, I would say start 10 years earlier than I did. But uh, yeah, of course, yeah, can't do that. So, I mean, that's that's probably my best advice. And, and I, it's advice I've given to people a lot before. And most of the time, the response I get is that they don't want to give up their current lifestyle and everything that they have. And uh, to me, that's just well, that's an indicative of how badly you want to be an artist. You know, I wanted to be an artist so bad I was willing to give everything up and change my lifestyle and work from the ground up. And I mean, eventually I ended up in a good spot. You know, we have a big, beautiful house. I have a big, comfortable studio. Um, we don't have to worry about making money. And, you know, it's it's finally, finally all paid off after, what, 10 years I've been doing it. Um, and, and now I can sort of explore all the interests that I have in painting. Um, and I'm even getting an assist. My assistant starts tomorrow. So I, I'm even having congratulations. An That's so, awesome. Uh, so then I'll have even more time to paint. So it's all very exciting. Um, but it did require me, you know, 10 years ago to just give all that up and then start from scratch. So I'm glad you mentioned that last part because I know that about you, what you've accomplished. Um, but so what you're not saying is that an aspiring artist is destined to be a quote unquote starving artist. But what you're saying is be smart with your money up front, live below your means so that you can take artistic risks and make and and uh, and set yourself up for the most success. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, uh, along that same vein, we always have the the philosophy of. My art is an investment. Uh, it, my art is a business. Right. And so we invest in it before we do other stuff. And so instead of, you know, going on a vacation somewhere, I might buy supplies I need, or we might buy business cards, or we might buy a website or something like that, because those are things that we feel invest in the business, which will grow my career and down the road, pay dividends. And, and um, thinking in that business sort of sense isn't something that I think artists are typically stereotypically known for, but it is important. I mean, this, if you want this to be your career, then you have to make sacrifices. You have to make investments and it can be your time. It can be your money. It could be everything. It could be your whole way of life, depending on your situation. Um, so, you know, like I said, I started out with, with nothing. I moved to Chicago with, I, I had a couple thousand dollars, like $2,000. I quit my job in Arizona moved to Chicago, got an apartment, and then went from there. And then flash forward three years later, I wanted to quit my job at the hospital. I had, I think again, two or $3,000 saved up in my bank account. And I told Brittany, I said, I wanna to try to be an artist. So I wanna quit my job. And you know, we had a couple thousand dollars in the bank. And at the time she had her dad's credit card. So she said, well, if it doesn't work out for you, I can always fly home. And so she said, <laughs> I don't care. So I did, I quit my job and um, we just did whatever art related thing, you know, taught classes, sold paintings. I even made canvas panels that I sold to students, um, whatever it took to make money so that I never had to go get a job again. Yeah, that's great advice. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you being on the podcast, Tim. It was really cool for you to share all that to the oh, audience yeah. and to me. And uh, it was a it was a huge honor. So thanks for being on it. And so could you tell uh, those who are listening how they can see your work? Sure. Um, I have a website, um, ReeseFineArt.com. Um, and social media is Instagram, Reese Fine Art. So that's pretty easy as well. And then we also have a media website that has some free videos and uh, free content and also links to buy, you know, that 
video program that, that I mentioned, which is um, resateliermedia.com. But you can link through that through my regular website, Reese Fine Art. Okay. Thanks again. It was great having this chat with you. You're welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.